Hello, I have the lovely Ted Ryan with me. Hello, Ted. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Hello, I'm Ted Ryan. I write under the pseudonym TJ Ryan and I'm the author of Between the Lines and Higher Education. And at the moment, I'm a self-published author, but I've done some screenwriting and playwriting in the past as well. Um, did you always want to be a writer? Yeah, it was um, it was an interesting journey where I kind of always imagined I'd be an author first and foremost. But when I got into university, I really fell in love with screenwriting and just the idea of visual storytelling and how you can say so much with so little. So for the last decade, I've mainly been focused on script writing and I studied it at university and then I did a course with the National Film and Television School. So getting into prose writing was quite new for me and it really only started because of the pandemic where I just kind of thought if I don't do this now I probably won't go for this style of writing so yeah that's what gave me the push to give this type of writing a try. So how did you jump from um, script writing to prose writing so it's quite a different skill isn't it? Yeah I mean it definitely is I mean I read a lot which is a good sign but also with screenwriting you can't go inside your characters heads on page I mean you can know it as the writer but you've got to give subtle hints to the actor to be like this is what he or she is feeling so for this it was really interesting that I was able to kind of go through my character's journey on page and just explore their psyche in depth and not think okay I know what they're thinking but how do I say it without saying it? So, yeah, it was actually a pretty easy transition. I was worried I would struggle, but as soon as I knew my characters, it got very easy after that. And did you always know that you'd write the genre that you write in, or was that an accident? <laughs> yeah, again, that was another accident where I thought I would probably do more crime or thrillers, but... I kind of fell into the romance genre and I'm glad that I did because the response that I've got has been pretty positive and just um, obviously for a man to be writing a romance genre is quite new for some readers and I'm, I'm glad I've got the female representation right, which is always a good thing to hear from your readers and that's always been a good thing to hear when I've worked with actresses that I can write female characters very well. So I've always been confident as like, oh, I can at least do a compelling female character. So yeah, going into romance was a bit of a kind of happy accident, but I'm glad I did because I've been able to break stereotypes of how men can write women. Awesome. Yeah, I know a few actually um, male romance writers now. Yeah, but definitely. I didn't. I didn't know any until the last few years. So yeah, yeah. It's... I'm glad it's kind of shifting a bit, and we're seeing more diversity in this genre. Yeah. Um, I've completely forgotten what I was going to ask you now. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> um, which of your um characters did you have most fun writing, and which made, gave you most trouble? Yeah, I mean, I would say Jonathan, the male lead of Between the Lines, was the most fun to write because he was just like that kind of arrogant love interest, but a lot of emotional depth underneath all of that. So tracking his character growth was quite fun to explore because I wanted to write a male love interest that isn't toxic like these we see in past romance novels to get a lot of hype. So I wanted to show, this is why these two have fallen for each other. They've got a lot in common. And the most difficult to write was definitely Tessa, purely because when I started, I'd written a completely different character for the female lead. So, but when I wrote a scene with those two characters, Jonathan and this different character, I just thought, I'm not, these two aren't really connecting. 
So I kind of scrapped the first two chapters and I started rewriting. And Tessa, once I kind of figured out her backstory of, uh, okay, this is a character who's quite dark. Like she's got a lot of emotional trauma. So going through that and uh, kind of exploring her emotional baggage, it was difficult, but also I'm glad I did it because it felt authentic to her character. Do you have to keep notes on your characters? Do you have a spreadsheet or a yeah. notebook? <laughs> um, um, not really. I mean, I, I respect the people that do, but sometimes it's just like, I mean, what helped with Tessa was I was able to go with flashbacks. So I wrote some chapters where you see her as a 14 year old and why she is the way she is as a 20 year old. So having that contrast, I was able to really just get into her head at those points and think, okay, but yeah, so I kind of just let the characters improvise at times. I need to know where I'm starting and where I'm finishing. And then I just improvise in between all of that. Um, when you did sit down and start to write, what did you find more difficult than you expected? And what did you find easier than you expected? <sighs> I think the most difficult part was the ending because I was fortunate enough to work with a great editor, Amanda Waller, who was brilliant during the editing process. But I didn't want to give the characters a happy ending just yet because I feel like where they got to at the end of book one, I just thought they can't reconcile after such a big revelation. So I, re I really went back and forth with my editor and she was like I hear what you're saying but some readers may not like this because of the genre so it was really kind of trying to decide whether I go with the gender norms of how to finish that as in the genre norms I mean or I just kind of go with what felt right for Jonathan and Tessa at the end of the book and I'm glad I did because book two has been really interesting to kind of bring them back together in a much gradual way so yeah that was the most difficult part trying to decide how to end it <laughs> because I think if I gave them a happy ending I probably wouldn't have gone back to their characters at the end of this book because then I'd have to undo all of that and cause more conflict <laughs> and um, the easy part was just finding the characters dynamics like I love exploring not only the romantic relationships but the family relationships and seeing how so many different relationships impact how you approach a relationship so just having all of these ensemble cast members to introduce was actually quite enjoyable because I think so many characters get forgotten in this genre because so many people are focused on the main two characters and it's like, but what about this character or that character? So yeah, having a much bigger cast to delve into was also great as well. Um, you said you um, read a lot and I would say um, I read a lot of crime and um, I would argue that setting and the story and the characters are important, whereas it feels like a romance, it's all about the characters. So yeah. would you say setting is um, um, the storyline are, are as important? Yeah, definitely. I mean, for me, because my characters are within the film industry to some capacity, I knew the media aspects of this would be important. And the fact that one of my characters is in university in her final year. So having, knowing where my characters were and exploring sort of themes that would impact that because my main character, well, the main male character is mixed race. So obviously as an actor in the industry, I wanted to kind of portray that aspect truthfully. So a friend of mine who's also an actor that I've written for, he did read those chapters and uh, thankfully he was like, yeah, no, I think you've got this right. But he was always there to kind of give a little bit of personal insights, which really helped write stuff that I have 
no personal knowledge of as a writer myself. So learning about the acting industry from an actor was vital for that character aspect. Whereas Tessa being in university as a screenwriter was a lot more easier because I put elements that I could relate to into it. So like that fear of the final year before graduation and you think, what am I doing now? It's like, I had all these plans and now it's just, I have no idea where I'm going. So yeah, those aspects I felt like to this series were important to explore. How did you choose your character names? Yeah, I mean, um, they kind of came randomly. Like, um, there wasn't really much thought put into it. I mean, I've always, it's weird because I feel like you name characters, names that sound nice and that you like, which I totally get. But I tend to think about when my character is born and then I'll research that year of certain baby names. And then I'll kind of go through that list and I'll think, yeah, this would have been realistic, but character born in this year would have been named this. So I actually do a little bit of research even with the names. Have you um, put anyone that you know into it? Um, I'd say probably some people could recognise themselves, but I don't intentionally put people I know into it. I feel like there are feelings and emotions and like situations that I could identify with or I could say how I would or wouldn't react in a situation like that. But I just kind of, I think as a writer, you subconsciously put things you know and people you know in your work. And it's only once you've read it back, it's like, oh, I, that wasn't intentional, but okay. I know <laughs> who that kind of is. Yeah, um, I've written um, and yeah. my one of my best friends read it and she's like, that character is so you. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it's totally you. I'm like, oh, okay, mm. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> um, do you hide any secret jokes or messages or Easter eggs in your book? Yeah, I mean, um, because Tessa was a reader, I like and basically a fan girl all round. I loved putting pop culture references into her kind of chapters and kind of just you know stuff that you wouldn't usually expect because I think. With some writers, they'll put, say, for example, if they're a fan of Harry Potter or Doctor Who, that's all the character will talk about. Whereas I think you're part of different fandoms if you're a fan of something. So the fact that she was talking about Doctor Who or Harry Potter, and then she'd be talking about Virginia Andrews books. And it's like, OK, she's got a vast like, level of interest. And I, I feel like that is a much more realistic type of fangirl rather than this is my fan done and that's it yeah absolutely i mean i do you know there are people that are like completely star wars or whatever and then that bit yeah but i love all sorts of stuff like harry potter yeah. completely i love harry potter but that doesn't mean that i can't tell yeah, you about you like only fours and horses or 40 towers or like michael jackson and you know it's it's wide ranging yeah. because you know and it's different kinds of life as well isn't it so yeah and obviously the fact that it was a contemporary piece it allowed me to think i can make reference to older pop culture but also more modern stuff and um i mean i did even make a reference to only fools and horses where um tessa sees her father for the first time in years and she thinks He's dressing like Del Boy. Like, <laughs> like, what is he wearing? So, yeah, I actually, I do enjoy putting pop culture references and giving just a bit of that side of reality to my characters, where if it's set in the same universe, you're allowed to kind of make reference to other people's work. Um, how have you been received by the uh, romantic writing community? I've, run it, I've, I've really appreciated the positive response by it because I felt like, do I need to, like, you know, did I need to go deep into the pseudonym persona? But I feel like I've really, I've been accepted by the romance reading community quite well. And I think that's, that's been really welcoming, but also quite a relief as well. So, so far I've received pretty good responses to this book in particular and I'm looking forward to 
possibly writing different genres and hoping that these readers will kind of be like, okay, this is totally different, but I'm willing to give it a go. So <laughs> yeah, so far it's been a pretty was like pretty good response from readers so far. Well, that's good because I've heard that. Uh, crime writers get all their um, bad stuff out on the page, whereas romance writers tend to be quite <laughs> <laughs> uh, different in real life. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. And uh, obviously I've really appreciated all the lovely comments from readers, the fact that some of them will be like, is there going to be a book too? And it's just that that fan enthusiasm that I never thought I'd get with my first book, but it's just been so nice to see people just take these characters to heart and just really enjoy it. Have you done any um, events yet or are you planning on doing any over the summer? I mean, definitely, I'm definitely open to doing more events. I think it's just finding the right event that will work and that's accessible for me to get to. So, yeah, that's something I'll definitely be looking into in the future. So, yeah, I mean, I did cool. a... Yeah, go on. I'd say it's probably too late this year anyway. Most of them are like yeah. up and stuff. So. so I think once I've got a couple more books in and I know... Doesn't matter readers, how many books. Yeah. Doesn't mm. matter. People, I know people that go to them with their first book and do really well with them. So Yeah, yeah so I think I'm going to start looking into conventions or tours that I can do and just, yeah, see how that goes. Well, I can, um, if I find out about any, I can email you. Um, as I usually know. I'm going to one this weekend that's um, a multi-genre event um, where people have table and sell their books and stuff and there's panels which I'm moderating and then I'm doing one in September again which is similar so oh that's really good yeah I, I get around <laughs> <laughs> I go to Harrogate the week after so oh, that's yeah good. and then Blood of Scotland and um, Capital Crime and um Shoreham from Hell and then Brighton, which I organise myself. So, yeah. Oh, that's good. There's loads of stuff, yeah. So, I'm more than happy to email you and tell you if there's anything that you can sign up for. And... Yeah, definitely. I think um, I'll definitely start doing the rounds with these conventions and tours. It's um, they're such a great way to get to know people and stuff as well, and to get to know your fellow authors as well, which is always nice. You know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I'm mad if I have to. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not proud. It's fine. I don't mind. It doesn't matter how many books you've written. Yeah, no, of course. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, uh, at the moment, this summer, there's nothing I'm involved with yet. But I think once I find one that I fit in as a writer and there's time to put my name forward, I'll probably definitely start doing the rounds when I can. Awesome. Um, when you're editing, um, or when you edit a reading book, what's your most overused word or phrase would you get told off for? Yeah, I mean, um, oh, I think there was a word that she pointed out, which I wish I could remember. But there was one where I used to put a uh, question mark and exclamation point when a character was also shouting and answering, asking a question. And she was like, you know, unless in very extreme circumstances, this is it. You can just get away with explanation point or question mark. So I realized I did that a lot. So now with this book, I'm a lot more conscious of it. And I just, I think working with an editor definitely made me self edit a lot more, even with working on book two. So that's all. Um, but yeah, there was a couple of phrases where she was like, um, you, You're using this a bit too much. So it was kind of just slimming that down. And, yeah, I think we've all had experiences where we've used the same word a lot. It's so like totally unintentional. Yeah, I love it because usually authors know it's the top of their head, just comes up a lot. And yeah. then like nodding or, you know, silly things that people must be making themselves feel but keep doing it, doing them <laughs> as much as the author writes. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I wish I could remember that word that came up, but it was couple years ago it was being edited so it's just completely gone out of my head so yeah th there were definitely phrases that I used a lot of like yeah so what's your oh, journey definitely definitely, definitely. Uh, was the word um yeah I could totally get that <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> so I used that a lot in the, the first draft. And I think I still use it because I think some people do use that even in their head. Like, oh, it's definitely this or definitely that. Even when it's not, they'll convince themselves like, oh, absolutely. So <laughs> definitely was one I used a lot. But one I still use because I feel like it's appropriate for Tessa. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Oh. oh, sorry, one second. Um, so what was your journey from um, sitting down and writing to actually getting published? Uh, it was quite a, um, it took me a while to kind of decide. Yeah, the journey to being published was, I wasn't sure which type of publishing I was going to go for. So once I'd edited the book, I kind of, decided just to go down the self-publishing route because I knew there was a lot more creative control. And um, the publishing houses, I did find that were specifically for romance books, tend to favour female authors. Even publishing houses that would have same-sex pairings, like two men, still be written by female authors so I found that too there wasn't a lot of specifically male authors being welcomed into those publishing spaces even on a indie level so that's why I thought I would go more self-publishing and to just have that creative freedom that I probably wouldn't have been able to have before and if you enjoyed it, I know it's hard work, but it is freeing, isn't it? Yeah, it was a lot of hard work, but definitely worth it in the end. Um, if you're able to spend a day with any author, dead or alive, who would you like to spend a day with? Oh, um, um, I think Philip Pullman for alive because I just the way I was I'm such a huge fan of his dark materials as a kid and even rereading re it as an adult that was just so much I didn't pick up on and uh, so yeah just to pick his brain and to ask when he's finishing the last his start materials book would be a good start uh, so that would probably be my live author there are so many it's really tough to pick but probably dead I would probably say Emily Bronte because there's just something about Wuthering Heights that's so melodramatic and tragic Similar with V.C. Andrews, and it's like, I kind of want to know what these authors were thinking when they wrote such dark stories. So, yeah, those would probably be my top three at the moment. Yeah, I'd quite like to meet them. Um, uh, Andrews, V.C. Andrews, yeah. Yeah. Um, most of my friends um, and I read Slouching Epic when we were teenagers. It didn't really material for a teenager, but... Yeah, there we are. <laughs> it's quite horrendous, but there we go. Great book. Yeah. <laughs> I think her other books were better, the ones that are less talked about. But Flowers in the Attic is obviously the more iconic one. Yeah, but they're all a, they're a set, aren't they? A trilogy or four? I, think, I, can't it, I think it was five books. It five, went on for yeah. a while. Five. Yeah, but I preferred My Sweet Audrina or Heaven, yeah. which were more kind of psychological coffee horrors. So I 
definitely enjoyed those more. Yeah, I've read most of your Audrina. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember. The <laughs> films were a lot more questionable, but yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's yeah, <laughs> it's a difficult one to do, isn't it? So, <laughs> um, uh, what have you read this year? What's the best stuff you've read this year? Oh, um, I read Lies She Told by I'm really gonna butcher the name, but I think it's Kate Holden, and yeah. that was basically about an author who is working on her latest manuscript. Her husband's best friend is missing. But each chapter jumps between her, the author, and her really messed up life that she's in denial about. And her her fictional character that she's writing, and you realise as the book goes on, they're very similar. So it's, it's literally looking at an author who puts her life into her work but doesn't realize it okay. so um yeah that was um that was an interesting concept but it kind of got a little bit melodramatic for me at the end i was like oh it's got a bit crazy <laughs> so yeah and um i've read a lot of thrillers this year which i've kind of enjoyed um i reread harry potter when i was in a bit of a reading slump So it's definitely been a real kind of mixed bag this year. And I've listened to quite a few audio dramas and audio plays. So, yeah, I really do punch out with uh, my Goodreads. (laughs) Oh, yeah, I'll read anything as well. Um, I think my last, I think um, I've done three blog tours the last three days. One of them was a children's book. One of them was a short uh, sort of ghost story. And the other one was um, like a um, dual timeline between now and World War II. So literally, yeah. I will read anything. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely. I've kind of struggled. This is weird. The romance author, but I've struggled to find a good romance that I've been invested in. Like, <laughs> like I just think it's been bad luck. The books I've picked up, I've not really shipped the main pairing yet. So. I know there's a good ones out there. It's just finding the ones that I get invested in. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know some writers can't read the same genre that they're writing in case they pick up the author's voice as well. So. Yeah, I think that might be it. It seems whenever I picked a romance, up a romance book, I've just kind of not felt it. And I've just wanted to go on something totally different compared to what I've written. Um, if you're able to travel to any period of time, where would you like to go, forwards or backwards? Oh, that's tough because <laughs> I feel like going back in time would be difficult as a writer in a wheelchair because historically it wasn't very disabled accessible. So I would probably want to go forward and see where we end up in like the next hundred years or so. I'd be curious to see the year three thousand. I have no desire to see it whatsoever. <laughs> I don't want to know what we've done. Yeah. Really <laughs> but in an ideal world, I'd probably want to see the Bronte era, maybe see like the Yorkshire Moors as they were back in the day and just really kind of embrace that gothic visual tone that they all of them clearly went for as writers. Yeah. <laughs> Um, if you were to be on Mastermind, what would your subject be? Um, I'd probably say Harry Potter. <laughs> I mean, I'd probably have to binge the films and the books again, but I'd probably, if, if I knew I was going on and I knew that was my specialist subject, I feel like that would be my top choice. If I had a Harry Potter off some time. Mm-hmm. I've read them lots as well, so I reckon that would be mine, maybe. Yeah. There's a lot of information there, though, isn't it, to remember when you're on the spot and ask my mother. <laughs> yeah. Especially when you're completely unprepared for the questions. Yeah, that'd be fine. Okay. Hmm. Um, what do you like to do when you're not writing? Um, watch films, go to the theatre, um, basically keep absorbing stories, even if I'm not writing them. So, yeah. 
And uh, at the moment, I'm really into big Finnish audio productions. So they mainly do canon Doctor Who audio dramas, which focus on the timeline of the TV series and afterwards or before. So, yeah, I'm actually more into those than I have been at the TV show at times because original actors get brought back and shows that, for example, get cancelled like Torchwood or the Buffy Doctor Who spin-off class. Those got picked up as audio dramas. So it was interesting kind of to see that there is clearly a fan base for these Doctor Who shows that didn't last as long as probably people wanted. So, yeah, I'm definitely into Big Finish a lot right now. Awesome. So you said you're writing book two, so what's coming next? <laughs> um, I feel like I'm leaning less into the romance with Unscripted. And this is definitely a book that explores mental health and uh, dealing with trauma. So it's actually, I, I was totally kind of taken off guard by it when I really started to think of the logistics because it just... It wasn't the same as Between the Lines, but I think that's good because it kind of shows it shows that relationships aren't all about love scenes or declarations of undying love and or and I just wanted to show those vulnerable moments where characters are there for each other in quite dark times and knowing when to seek help. So yeah, this this is really kind of like it's it's different, but I think it's the right story for both of these characters. And it's showing a lot of character. Awesome. Um, well, I don't think I have any more questions for you unless you think there's anything I haven't asked you that you want to tell us about. Um, yeah, no, I think that's it. Um, again, uh, thank you. And <laughs> sorry about the technical issues earlier. <laughs> that's all right. Um, um, yeah, go on. So just before we go, would you like to tell everyone where they can um, get your book from and find yeah. out about, more about you if they'd like to? Yeah, I mean, you can get Between the Lines on Amazon. And I've also published a short story as a bit of a filler between the first and the second book. So those are both on Amazon right now. And you guys can follow me on Instagram or Twitter under TJ Ryan Wright. And... Hopefully, I'll be announcing some more books soon that I've been working on. So, yeah, definitely go to those places. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Have a good day.